Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our final City Futures Research Seminar for this uh, year, 2022. Today's seminar is brought to you by the Postgraduate Working Group, which is chaired by Susan Thompson. Uh, I'll hand it over to Susan to formally um, begin the seminar and introduce the speakers. Well, thank you very much, Rupa, and my very warm welcome to everyone. I would like to acknowledge country and just to let you know that today I'm coming to you from the border of the Gadigal and Wongal tribes of the Eora Nation. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you on uh, Bidjigal land over at UNSW. So welcome to everyone and anyone who is also joining online, please feel free to let us know what country from, from where you are joining us. Thank you, uh, Rupa. Just to the next slide. Um, before I introduce our speakers, as Rupa's already said, I convene the City Futures Research Centre Postgraduate Working Group, and I'm absolutely delighted that I am able to be introducing this particular seminar where we're going to be showcasing four of our wonderful postgraduate students. The, um, the seminar today, we're going to hear from the four students whose smiling faces are up there on, on the screen and they're going to be presenting their, their work. I'm going to briefly introduce each speaker and their topic and they'll present each for about 10 minutes and then we'll have a combined Q&A at the conclusion of all the presentations. So first of all to Alessandra Buxton and we we, we call Alessandra Ali, and um, Ali also works within the centre and Ali is going to be talking about her research project on sharing spaces, moving places, the experience of young single women living in share housing in Greater Sydney. And through her presentation, Ali will be bringing out the importance of understanding young women's perspectives of share housing and introduce her research that's going to be examining what living and share housing looks like for young women and how they experience it and how it impacts on, on their lives and on their future. So over to you, Ali, and many thanks. Hi, everybody. Hi. Oh, wait, let me put my timer on so I can keep track of myself. Not cool. <laughs> um, it is so nice to finally be down this end. I'm usually um, back in the room, so thank you very much for having me. Um, but yeah, way of introduction and thank you for that lovely introduction, Susan. My name is Ali Buxton. I work at City Futures Research Centre and I am a master's candidate. My topic is looking at the experiences of young single women in share housing. Are my notes there, Rupa, by any chance? <laughs> yes, they are. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, um, so before I get started, I'd also like to acknowledge the land that I'm speaking on today, which is the land of Aboriginal people, and extend my respect to any elders past or present. I would also like to acknowledge that the research I will be doing will be on country, on the uh, land of the Eora Nation, and uh, express how lucky I am to be doing research on country. So when I think of share housing, I often like to think of this quote by Dr. Sophia Marlson. Um, uh, her paper titled, I cannot afford to live in this city alone and I enjoy the company of others. So I really like this as a quote as I feel like it really encapsulates the experience of living in share housing in both the positive and the negatives in a really short statement. So when researching for this presentation, I tasked myself with uh, finding alternative perspectives on shared living um, and how this is presented in academic literature. And the one thing that really truly came through a lot was that this is a necessity and it's one of the few options that young people have to live independent from their parents. So you can see this in this quote from Jones here. So with this form of living becoming more of a popular option amongst young people, naturally there comes a suite of benefits and challenges and unique experiences. 
and specifically relating this to young women. Um, so some research from the UK from Eleanor Wilson and Elena um, Ortega Alcazar um, highlight that shared living can pose um, certain risks and um, differences to, to marginalised and vulnerable um, people and has certain risks that are relevant specifically to women. So this brings me to my topic. So as, um, as we all know, it's no secret that there is an ongoing housing crisis in Australia um, and young people are certainly experiencing the brunt of this. So the term generation rent is thrown around a lot and this often refers to people who young, young people who have essentially been priced out of the housing market. So with people renting for longer, um, inevitably um, in cities like Sydney with the rising prices, you've got people living in share housing um, as a means of affordable living. So this brings me to my first focus. Why share housing? So the media depiction of share housing is seen as this fun, chaotic period um, in a young person's life, a coming of age experience, if you will. And, you know, you see this in Friends, in the Big Bang Theory, Trooper tri Girls, New Girl, so on and so forth. And whilst this is definitely rooted in truth, uh, this share housing is no longer just a transitional experience, but a long term reality. So there are growing trends of people living in share housing from their early 20s up until the mid to late 30s. And this makes sense as home ownership is at an all time low. So why share housing in Australia? <laughs> so as I've said before, the um, share housing in Australia is growing and um, as such, so is discourse. So, you know, the articles like this, you know, the top 10 reasons to live in share housing, the benefits of living in share housing um, and so forth. But at the same time, and be forewarned, this is an article just, just on Facebook. You also see uh, articles like, oh, sorry, you guys are right. Yeah, we, we're just, just trying to make, we're just muting and it's just going to release, continue. <laughs> no, that's okay, I just can't click the screen because you're on oh, the other one. That's okay. So you can mute, if you can do it on your computer. Yeah, if you're going to mute. Do you mind just clicking the screen so I can click the, thank you. Yeah, beautiful. All right, cool. All right, I, that was a big drum roll to the um, the horrible um, article I'm about to show. So, <laughs> so whilst, yeah, you see articles like this, like the benefits of share housing, you also see stuff like this, which is really gross. Um, so I'm going to cover that really quickly. So <laughs> in a basic, uh, yesterday I tasked myself with doing a, a little search on Facebook um, in and just looked up um, in advice groups and share housing groups um, experiences and the immediate results I came up with with stuff like this. So people looking for advice on bad housemates, threads on um, looking for horror stories on shared living. And as you can see, there are hundreds of comments and they are in some of the stories are absolutely insane. You got people sharing um, stories about um, about abuse of, of certain persons. You've got people sharing um, stories of bad landlords. You've got stories of negligence and uh, dodgy properties, and black mold being painted over. Um, and you've also got people looking for general tenancy rights living in share housing. So, and something I noticed in this just really basic search uh, is that the stories, the, the scary stories. Um, concerning say abuse and safety concerns were coming from women. So this brings me to my next next aspect, why young single women. So aside from my lived experience as a young woman in share housing, um, the choice to understand women's experiences is rooted in a general lack of research of women in general inside housing research. So women are systematically and historically left out of big data, whether this be medical or social, and these stats are exacerbated even more when you look at minority groups. So this research aims at filling a gap in um, academic literature on the shared the experiences of young women. And this is just not to say there is no research on women's experiences, but gen they tend to look at you know women in the domestic household or in the nuclear family, women as a homogenous group, elderly women or women who've experienced domestic violence. So women, um, and you know, this is quite a shame because, you know, women aged between 18 to 34 do make up a decent portion of the Australian population. And research does show that women do have diverse experiences in day-to-day -day life. And the research that does exist does show that 
the experiences within the home are different, but this research is not applicable to share housing. So the, there is a report that came out of the UK that does um, kind of touch upon this, and this report did find that vulnerable women and um, uh, vulnerable women are further at risk um, in share housing and can also, um, share housing can impact experiences of safety as well. So why Greater Sydney? Um, aside from the most logistical um, place to be, considering I am here, um, it is also the most expensive city in Australia. Um, and not only that, the group household population in Greater Sydney is growing faster than the rate of um, population growth. So you can see this um, here from a study from in 2021, um, the density change um, in 10 years between 2006 and 2016 in share housing, and so it's a huge jump. Not only that, um, Greater Sydney um, holds 22% of Australia's total share house population, which is a really big figure. So share housing, the population in Greater Sydney has increased by 21%. This is data I pulled from the ABS census data. And this is actually 7% higher than the national average. And the average rate of growth between 20 to 35 year olds is around 22%. And the largest uh, percentage of growth is actually seen between 25 and 20, 39 year olds, which is almost 30%. So why young single women? So women aged between 18 to 34 make up about a third of the share house population in all of Greater Sydney. Um, it's a bit of a, there's a bit of a drop um, here in 18, 19 year olds, which I am attributing to COVID, um, as I highly doubt there's um, been a big, big shift in people living in share housing in the last three years. However, it will be really interesting to see if this trend changes. Um, but overall, in Greater Sydney, there's been a 14% increase of women aged between 18 to 34 living in share housing. So my research questions. So I've got three questions here. The first is looking at the factors um, that contribute to living in share housing. So looking at, you know, why they're living in share housing, what contributed to this, was it financial, was it personal, why they're living in their current property. The second one is looking at the living arrangements, how they experience it, the formal and informal dynamics. Do they hang out? Who cleans? Who's on the lease? Do they share a room? Do they hang out? Simple questions like that. And third, the one that I'm actually most interested to see what um, the research finds is the impacts on the future. So how does living in share housing now impact future decision making in terms of family, family formation, having children, getting married, buying a home, so on. So my methodological approach is a phenomenological approach. <laughs> Try to say that fast. Um, so phenomenology essentially is the study of lived experience. Um, it was uh, founded by German philosopher Edmund Husserl. So uh, looking essentially at a phenomenon, um, why phenomenon exists and the, the essence of this phenomenon. So and something um, that's, in, that's highlighted a lot in phenomenology is um, uh, a, the investigator's approach. And that's something I need to be very careful of, um, given my lived experience as a woman in chair housing, something I'm trying to try to be cognizant of as um, my research progresses. So my data sources will be um, a questionnaire and interviews. The questionnaire hopefully will be um, uh, submitted on Facebook pending ethics approval. Um, but I'm hoping to get um, around two to 300 respondents and uh, around 20 to 30 participants of interviews. And my implications. So at the moment, these are very flexible given the, it's the earlier stages, but ideally I'd like to increase awareness of shared living for young women in Sydney. I'd like to identify the differences between shared living for young women versus the general um, shared housing cohort, um, provide insight into the prolonged implications um, in terms of you know, family formation and location decisions. And overall, I'd really like to just contribute to literature regarding shared housing. Very much for your time. <laughs> Well, wow, thank you so much, Ali. And I think your talk really brings to the fore the importance of lived experience and how we as researchers need to hear those varied voices, those very different stories of how people experience phenomena, and in your case, women in shared housing. And I think it's uh, uh, such an important and contemporary topic and it's going to be great as some of your research findings come come forward and we look forward to hearing them about that 
uh, maybe next year at the, another seminar of postgraduate students. We're going to continue with the housing theme and we're now going to be hearing from PhD candidate Parianne Hoysien. And Parianne is talking about her research on new waves of neighbourhood disruption, examining the cumulative impacts of student student studentification and Airbnbization, which is also hard to say, in Sydney, Australia. And um, Parian's project aims to study the localised disruptions of housing systems caused by the cumulative impacts of concentrations of student and tourist renters in certain areas of Sydney. And again, an enormously important topic given the housing shortage and the um, housing unaffordability issue that so many people are facing in Sydney and, of course, in other cities. So is Parian ready to present? Thank you, Susan. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, I would like to pay my respect to the country custodians and uh, others. Uh, and it, it's really uh, it's really nice to hear that uh, hear that researchers, young researchers like me and Ali, are bringing their own experience into research. And because part of, the, part of my uh, research topic is coming from my own uh, living experience as a student, as a university student. And uh, I had problems with the student housing and the neighborhood I was living and that was what I needed, the problems I, I faced with it. So uh, I started with studentification when I first started my PhD and now it is just polished and modified to this much better shape that studies the the cumulative impacts of studentification and Airbnbization in Sydney, Australia. And I, I'm not really the best, I mean, these are not my favorite terms too, but, but that's how people are dressed, so we need to use them. Um, in the past 20 years, cities, the global cities uh, and the neighborhoods are just uh, significantly reshaping by newcomers. And by newcomers, we specifically mean higher education students and uh, tourists. Just in the past two years, these two population cohorts have dramatically increased. And when these people just come to cities, they naturally look for a place to stay. So they create a kind of new housing demand. And this new demand has impacts on the local uh, rental market and the neighborhood conditions. It also can uh, encourage transformation of invest investments in the housing. They can play into the broader trend of housing financialization, which is happening globally, and it also incorporates technological disruptions. And all of all of these impacts in Sydney uh, are also enhanced by the liberal rental regulation. The first process. Studentification is a term given uh, to the impacts of neighbor impacts on neighborhoods that they originate from the influx of higher education students. At first, it was introduced in the UK and was uh, was explained to have four general uh, sorts of impacts. And as the studies just developed in all over the world. It shows that it has specific housing impacts and neighborhood impacts. And uh, well, few of the most significant ones are associated with housing prices and rental costs. Uh, by encouraging new developments, such as purpose-built student accommodation, as we can see in Australian context. It is also associated with repurposing existing con conventional rental stock from long-term single household, household uh, properties into short term and or multiple houses. And it is also connected with relation, reduction in housing in owner occupation. Australia is the third most popular uh, 
popular destination for international students. And Sydney, among Australia, is the second large, has the second largest number of educational students. And uh, according to this ABS data in 2019, most state students are um, just located, they're living in inner and eastern suburbs, just close to the university campuses. And uh, although there are huge, uh, some, some, some suburbs here have a huge population of students, there are very few studies that just uh, look at student identification and their neighborhood impacts in Sydney. The next concept I'm going to talk about is uh, related to short term lettings via uh, online platforms such as Airbnb, and I'm going to just uh, Call it call all old short term lettings as a generic name of Airbnb. And just like student population and student housing, Airbnb listings tend to have some sort of geographical concentration in city centers or resort localities most, mostly. So this term uh, is, is given to address this, the local impacts of uh, rising Airbnb listings. Among the housing, the impacts it can have on the local housing system, we can name of some uh, inflations of local rental prices because the mainstream rental properties may be redesignated for short term use. It is associated with transform of trans transformation of formerly owner occupied into rental use. And specifically in Australia, Airbnb's uh, tended the success to engage the fragments of housing stock that, that were neither owner occupied nor even within the rental uh, rental stock. And in Sydney, in, in Australia, the multi billion dollar business has just grew dramatically from 2014 to 2019. And Sydney is among top Ten list that has top ten listings globally, and just like student population, these listings are mostly concentrated in the eastern and uh, the inner and eastern suburb that kind of overlap with student population. All I did, just talked about till now just refer to pre twenty twenty period, and although COVID pandemic is not a pivotal part of my work, but it's inevitable to include that because uh, just in 2022, after the border closure in Australia, the population of higher education students and both international and domestic tourism just stopped and started to fall dramatically. And the urban impacts of that were notable in Phoenix, Sydney and Melbourne with, those, with dramatic increase in vacancy rates, falling rents and short term rental properties were just Transformed to return back to the mainstream uh, market in some areas. Of course, uh, cities and neighborhoods are, are, are recovering from the, that period, but uh, the coming, the increasing housing demand from students and uh, tourists does have does play a, play a role in this process too. So going back and forth with with the data and the literature review, I can identify some. Uh, significant research gap. First is that the existing studies are mostly dominated by predefined concepts, meaning that they're either focusing on studentification or another concept that they just limit the research from engaging with other influential factors. These studies are mostly focused on uh, geographical analysis, means a combination of economic and housing and demographic uh, analysis, and a housing system narrative is often overlooked. Also, very few study, if there are any study, uh, assess the cumulative impacts of student education and urbanization and the dimensions of rental market and neighborhood change associated in uh, those localities affected by both these pro processes. And also, uh, more recent studies are calling for integrated investigations on these uh, transformation processes. So what I'm going to do in this research is to study the localized disruptions of the local housing systems in the in areas that are um, in, uh, affected by both studentification and urbanization process in order to build up upon the existing literature 
to better acknowledge uh, these effects. And I'm going to do that through unpacking and analyzing multiple housing system and neighborhood impacts. And there are four questions uh, navigating my research. The first one is, what are the geographies of uh, student population and short-term lettings in Sydney? To what extent they exist? What are their motives? Uh, I'm going to do that using the data from ABS and uh, and the air DNA the data from uh, for Airbnb. The second question is that how have student identification and Airbnbization disrupted housing market dynamics, which just um, reflects my criticism to the lack of housing uh, housing narrative. Third question. Uh, investigates the perceived neighborhood impacts, meaning that what do people think of the local people and the experts about what's going on? And the fourth question is uh, related to the regulatory frameworks. To what extent the existing policies uh, respond and address these changes and what, what can be done to just uh, improve them? In terms of implications, uh, my, my Research has implications in three levels, both, both in city wide, Sydney scale, uh, because we can see uh, a strong presence of international students and Airbnb really listing overlapping together. There are implications for other major Australian cities because they just share some commonalities uh, in, in the rental market that are um, in the community. In yeah, they're just common with, between uh, Australian cities, like a large working holiday is a population that are, they are sort of uh, some component. They, yeah, they can fit in within the rental market. And in international level, there are other examples of uh, look, mm, national, large economically vibrant cities that they do represent a large population of students and uh, tourist visitors like San Francisco, London, Auckland. And uh, thank you for your <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Parianne, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. And look, just before we move on to our next speaker, just a, a tiny reminder, housekeeping, if you can make sure that you have turned off your microphone, but also your video camera, if you're not actually speaking, that would be appreciated. So Parianne's talking about some big disruptions here that interestingly I think are impacting on individual lives, people living in their homes, but then the, the um, well, I was going to say the ripple effect, but going beyond the home into the, the broader neighbourhood. And I think the understanding of the cumulative impacts of this is just so important. And I know that as a planner, we've not been very good at really understanding cumulative impacts in lots of situations. So, Parianne, it's going to be great to see your outcomes of your research because it's really, really important. And that really is a nice segue to our next um, student speaker, PhD candidate Christopher Robinson. And Christopher is talking about decision support for multifunctional urban landscapes. And, and Christopher's focus is on the challenges that we face in delivering services and meeting the well-being needs of growing urban populations. Um, and indeed, thinking about the need for urban landscape decision support tools that can provide integrated ways to consider diverse multifunctional landscape interactions at different spatial and temporal scales. I have the enormous pleasure of being one of Christopher's supervisors. So I, I know his work is fantastic and exciting, and I'm delighted that you're going to learn more about it right now. So thanks so much, Christopher. Thank you, Susan. Um, so I also want to give my acknowledgement to country, and um, it's something I'm slowly learning about the more time I spend here and learning how to properly express that. Um, but since Susan did a great job explaining, I'll just jump straight to 
um, what my topic is, I'll jump straight to the fact is why is multifunctionality important for urban areas? Well, as urban populations continue to grow, cities are facing increasing pressures to make better use of limited space and designing and managing built environments so that they can better provide multiple services or meet multiple needs is increasingly seen as crucial for ensuring urban sustainability. However, a state of practice review in 2019 has found that achieving urban multifunctionality is not an easy process and it often requires enabling steps such as conducting spatial assessments, establishing strategic guidelines, and changing design and management practices at site levels to better consider synergies and trade-offs between different functions, as well as ensuring sufficient interdisciplinary collaboration. And it's these later aspects that my research is really interested in because I'm trying to develop a framework that can help different cross-disciplinary collaborators make site-level design and management decisions that can hopefully improve landscape multifunctionality. Um, I do want to further clarify though what I mean by multifunctional urban landscapes because there are various definitions and interpretations of multifunctionality which you can see here but for the sake of time I'm not going to dive into them. I just want to emphasize that rather than the exact number or arrangement of landscape functions, I'm more concerned about the awareness and intention that landscape designers and managers have towards on-site functions and their interactions, considering both inherently natural functions and intentionally designed functions. In that sense, it's the in explicit intention to holistically design different functions and their interactions to achieve multiple outcomes, desired outcomes, that makes a site multifunctional. I'd also like to point out some characteristics of decision support tools and systems. Um, decision support features tend to fall into four basic categories of knowledge management, problem processing, language input uh, features, and then presentation output features. And more developed decision support systems, for example, Google Maps, would have all of these features, but more limited decision support tools may only have select features. Now, my research is really kind of focused on developing a framework that can be kind of a proof of concept or a blueprint for developing a decision tool or sort of system in the future. So it's more focused right now on understanding the types of descriptive knowledge, the problem processing elements, and the presentation elements that are necessary for current or multifunctional urban landscape decisions. Um, so how am I going about developing this framework? Well, I first started off with systemic review of and thematic analysis of relevant landscape decision tools. That is that they considered or were promoting landscape multifunctionality. Um, in examining these tools, I was able to identify key decision factors and or dimensions and functional relationships that re recurrently emerge as being important. I also noticed some issues that were common amongst these tools and the fact that they often didn't closely examine site level decisions and usually didn't deeply consider three dimensional functional relationships. Um, but they nevertheless provided a good starting point to try and develop my own framework. So this is kind of the current version of my framework. Um, Starting off, you have space and time, which provides temp spatial and temporal functions, which allow for the presence of structures that comprise landscapes, which have their own structural functions. A subset of structures are agents, which also possess the capability of carrying out agency functions. The interactions between structures, agents, and functions lead to specific outcomes. Decision makers are viewing these interactions through their own decision lenses and choosing to make decisions or choosing to make actions to influence these interactions, which these actions are also agency functions, to then achieve certain outcomes. Now, this is the top level of this framework. So there are much, there are deeper levels that go into more depth about these various dimensions, but for the sake of time, I'm only going to further discuss functions. So for spatial temporal functions can include occupation, which is the provision of space that can allow the occupation of structures. Um, traversal, which is space that provides uh, space that structures can move through, and perception, space that agents can that they can perceive through. Structural functions include access, which is how structures can alter access to different spaces. 
move motion, which is how structures move through different spaces, and then conversion, which structures are altering the functional characteristics of other structures. Agency, which is agents perceiving and understanding these relationships and interactions. Com coordination, which is agents cooperating in order to achieve certain outcomes. And control, which is agents manipulating structures and functions to achieve those outcomes. And then there's also functional interactions like conflicting, where two functions are both uh, negatively impacting each other. Uh, competitive, where one function is enhanced at the expense of another function, and then synergistic, where two functions are both benefiting each other. Um, now, so I have a prototype decision framework, but how am I going to further kind of refine this framework so they can be better applied? So what I'm, my next steps are really to apply the framework to real world landscape sites that were designed with multifunctional objectives in mind to see how well the framework works in describing the site multifunctionality and providing decision support. One of the sites that I'm using as a case study is the Randwick Health and Innovation Precinct uh, Campus Redevelopment Site, which is actually located to the uh, east of UNSW campus. And um, I also hope to interview the site designers to get an understanding of how they conceptualize multifunctionality on the site and also get their feedback regarding the, the, the framework. As a part of this case study and interview process, I'm also developing 3D voxel landscape models to that, so to better um, represent the 3D relationships that, that would be harder to represent using just um, 2D models. Now, 3D vo voxels are 3D pixels or 3D uh, virtual building blocks that allow you to create 3D visualizations and conduct 3D analysis. Um, one nice thing about the voxels is that they allow the depiction of 3D functional relationships to make that process much easier and faster. So I also hope to use these models in the interviews as an elicitation tool, working together with the interviewees to kind of map out different functions on the site, analyze those functions, and hopefully identify areas of functional interaction. Um, eventually, I, after the interviews are done, I also hope to work with cross-disciplinary focus groups to kind of further get uh, further uh, more diverse perspectives and feedback regarding the uh, framework and to make refinements to that framework. And so that kind of covers where my progress is currently with my research. Thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions when we get to the Q&A part. Thank you so much, Christopher, um, for taking us out into the neighborhood and we're going to go further out into the neighborhood thinking about well how do we get around our neighborhoods how do we move across them and josephine roper also a phd candidate in the city futures research center is going to be talking about her work on differing approaches to walkability this is certainly one of my favorite topics i have to confess and I, I love the fact, Josephine, that you've you've just reminded us that walking for transport, and I would also add walking for leisure and recreation. I know that's not your focus here, but it's the old, certainly the oldest form of transport. Um, long overlooked, but increasingly we're returning to knowing just how important walking is, you know, in part as we, we seek our healthier and more sustainable ways of living in cities. Um, really looking forward to hearing about how you are conceptualising, measuring and improving walkability in your research. And um, I was just also thinking, well, I'll hand over to you now and I guess in the back of our minds, and I'm going to plant this little seed for everyone, we're shortly contemplating all the wonderful walks that we can explore on the upcoming weekend, especially those of us who've actually just finished all our marking and um, looks like it might be a wonderful weekend. So inspire us about walking and walkability, Josephine, as I know you will, and um, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Don't give away all the highlights or anything. But yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I have avoided laying out my whole PhD in this talk because I've done that here before and I know some of you have heard it before. 
decided to skip that, take a step back, try and talk about the interesting aspects of walkability, different approaches, and why I've done my work the way that I have done it. So, uh, I'm going to start by really broadening the field of uh, what we talk about with walkability. Uh, a lot of research kind of defines one walkability uh, as if that's the one true walkability, continues to use that. Uh, there's also often a focus on singular benefits like health, uh, public health in cities. I actually think there are many possible benefits of walkability for individuals, not just health and well-being, but also cost, having access to a free, convenient mode of transport um, there whenever you need it, uh, property value potentially, and then from a city perspective, uh, the economic benefits of that, uh, as well as air quality and carbon emissions uh, being better if more people are using walking instead of other modes of transport. So yeah, as well as that, we've got walkability for transport, exercise and leisure, uh, and all the different people that walkability can be for. So yes. So um, different methods that have been used to study walkability. Fairly quickly, I've put them in four broad groups. The qualitative methods, um, like interviewing people, usually trying to answer questions about why specific people or groups of people can or can't walk in the city, uh, what they want, or case studies of specific areas, looking at what barriers are. Uh, another major method is streetscape auditing. This is focused on uh, street or network segment, um, usually with a very long list of items, uh, like the presence of footpaths, lighting, curb cuts, and so on. Uh, uh, difficult to implement broadly, usually because they are very long. So a third method is what I'm called the original walk score, sometimes called walk index method. I think that's not a very good term. Um, based on this concept of the three Ds, uh, density, diversity, and design, which originally was a, a kind of very broad concept, but in walkability has normally been operationalized in quite a narrow way uh, using data sources that are widely available for many cities, uh, like population density, intersection density on networks, and concepts of land use mix, um, providing a rough approach to where destinations are. So um, usually this gives us an answer about roughly how walkable a suburb or a city is relative to others. It's usually a relative scale uh, and applies to areas. Uh, and finally, access-based methods to walkability where the question is how useful and attractive is walking as a mode of transport, uh, usually able to provide results at every single point. So um, a, a kind of history of where you know uh, walking in cities has come from. As Susan says, original transport system for all cities, uh, we see that walking has shaped the design of the older cities and historic cores of old cities, usually into a form where there are as many buildings as close together as possible. Um, we, 19th and 20th century, have seen the addition of faster transport systems, um, such as railways and motor vehicles. And the history of transport planning, which is um, kind of where my background is, is that transport planning has been about these faster modes principally, and walking was kind of taken for granted. People have always walked, people will continue to walk, we don't really need to plan for that. Uh, and initially that was true. You look at a transit-oriented city, like early tram, tram suburbs in Sydney or early suburbs on train lines, often walkable suburbs uh, where people were using those trams to commute. But then the rise of motor vehicles has made that increasingly problematic and kind of push people away from the streets. When I say making traditional walking difficult, I mean traditional walking as in walking as the right of way, as what you expect to be able to do, walk down the middle of the road, which is always kind of foreign to us now. You know, in many places, it's actually criminalized to walk on the road, do jaywalking. Um, but that is traditionally what walking as transport means. So the fact that that traditional walking has become more difficult um, was noticed in the middle of the 20th century um, and led to the kind of the start of walking research. Uh, on one hand, the kind of qualitative method, methods and I'm thinking here of things like uh, Jane Jacobs' work in describing cities, describing neighbourhoods that seem more or less walkable and have more or less people walking. Uh, but there's also the start of auditing methods um, when you look at the work of uh, disability rights groups in creating smooth, continuous footpath networks and curb cuts, which are now ubiquitous in developed countries like Australia. 
uh, in general. Uh, but the only reason that infrastructure has become necessary um, is uh, really that it's it's car infrastructure, not walking infrastructure, it's because you can't walk on the street there, you need the footpath, um, you need the curb ramps and so on. So um, the more recent um, line of research on walkability has been noticing the connection between people who do still work, walk for transport and health. Um, but studying this, um, you know, in a, in a more of a big data way, uh, which large numbers of points, um, is what led to those uh, walk index methods using data that's readily available for a whole city, such as population density, using that to get a measure of how likely people are to walk and seeing if that relates to health or not. Um, that's been very powerful. Um, what I'm looking at um, is access based methods because I think these provide the most insight into if we want to return to walking as a method of transport more generally in cities. And yeah, uh, there's a push for this nowadays. Um, just this week or recently, I've had an active transport strategy released for New South Wales. This is something that didn't exist before. You know, we had a New South Wales transport strategy that covered primarily faster modes as the focus, with a few lines at the end about how walking should be safe as part of these designs. Uh, but the idea that we actually want active transport as a way to get places uh, has come back to the forefront. So for those who are not on transport, the way I'm using accessibility is this um, destination access meaning where uh, the travel network and land use could combine to create a generalized cost of reaching destinations on that network. Uh, and how this applies to walking, um, well, the generalized cost of walking is not just uh, time or distance, it also includes how pleasant or unpleasant different segments are to walk on. We know that people don't necessarily take the shortest or fastest route. Um, however, distance is definitely uh, probably the overwhelming factor for walking. Uh, and I'll come back to that. So just a Little, little illustration I made of how, you know, what access perspective really means. This is a person in Namia trying to walk places. This is how far they can walk. Uh, this person has a land use problem. They can't really get to many useful things just because they live in these fairly dispersed suburbs. On the other hand, we have this person living in Goldwood. On the face of it, they do not have a land use problem. They live right next to Willow Creek right here, which, um, it's such a high population density. The last time I checked, it supports three separate bubble tea shops, which is quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Along with the, yeah, four supermarkets and many other useful destinations. However, this person cannot get there because they are lacking in network links. There is no bridge over the river um, to get there. They have to walk almost two kilometers around via Tarela or um, via Tempe to get to Willow Creek. And that's a very like blunt example, right? But it would be the same situation if there were network links that were extremely unpleasant to walk on that had a high impedance. Uh, if we're talking in terms of generalized costs, making it difficult for someone um, to actually experience access despite positive land use. Okay, oh man, it's too fast. Oh, let's do this one. Just another illustration of um, you know, different environments that I see illustrating with dichotomy between walking network conditions and destination access. Sorry. So, um, in my opinion, uh, research on walking has pretty well covered what makes walking comfortable. We know what it is. Um, we know what people want. We know what they need, um, including for different user groups. However, um, a lack of looking at travel time and destination access for walking for transport. Um, Example here is this pedestrian crossing that's just gone in outside my house. I read all the documents, obviously, because I'm that kind of person. All the documents talk about uh, improving safety, safety for kids walking to school, uh, amenity and calming traffic. None of them say that this is going to save travel time for pedestrians, even though it does. You don't have to wait to cross the road anymore. It's just something we don't talk about, even though putting in a new slip lane at the intersection or changing the traffic light timing just to save a few seconds for cars is considered important. Uh, and worth talking about, but not so much for walking today. So I um, thought I might as well show some of my work quickly. Uh, I don't have time, obviously, to go through it, uh, but it's a gravity-based access measure. Yeah, 
um, using all the different categories of destinations that people need to go to in their lives to produce one average number of what percentage they might be able to access. Uh, what use is this kind of one average number? Obviously, uh, it doesn't represent different parts of the population uh, separately. However, it's a really quick way to show the population average effect of changes or to compare different cities or compare different modes. So uh, this example of change, this is back to Elwood, while I creak again. If you added some of these bridges, three bridges here, um, how many more destinations people living here would be able to get to? That's not actually, that's using an earlier version of main next, but yeah, you get the idea. Um, another case, so comparing cities, uh, for conference, I looked at Edinburgh and Canberra, two capital cities with very different histories, different development patterns, and showing the uh, different distributions of uh, walkable access across the population there, which is quite striking. And finally, oh no, I didn't do one with different modes. But anyway, that's something I'm working on. Uh, cool. Thank you. Well, well, thank you so much, Josephine. And all I can say is what a showcase of our postgraduate research students and their exciting and critically important work. Um, evolving, uh, it's going to be super exciting to see so much of um, the, the outcomes of this work from you know the individual unique experiences of people in their homes going out into the neighbourhoods. Now, um, I know I'm not in the room with you physically, but I'm just going to ask you to come to the front of the room um, so that we can have a bit of a panel Q&A. And I'm going to hand over to Rupa, who's going to facilitate the Q&A and make some concluding remarks. So over to you, Rupa, and thank you for the wonderful presentations. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I might start with questions in the room first because we don't seem to have any questions online as yet. So if you have any burning questions for these uh, insightful speakers, fire away. Don't jump out at one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is for Ali. Um, in terms of uh, in, in terms of housing um, for young people, so one of the things which um, which we hear recently, like especially from London, is like young people living with their parents, mm -hmm. and how much of that do you think will uh, will impact your study, or like how much of that is part of uh, young people living? Not having their own place. You yeah. Know. Um, how much will it impact, like my findings? Do you yeah. mean? Yeah. I mean, I think it will definitely impact, it, especially after COVID. Like you saw that stat of like how much, it's like forty-two percent drop in the last ten years between eighteen and nineteen-year-olds um, living in share housing, and I think that can definitely be attributed to COVID. I mean, stats do show that people are living in with their parents for longer as well. Um, they're less likely to fly a nest, so to speak, but. What the evidence also shows is that people who've already moved into share housing are still there. Um, so I think whilst it will impact maybe the earlier findings, it probably won't change the entire cohort, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. We have a question from Siddharth Badi online. I imagine this is for Josephine. Is walking beyond 400 to 800 metres realistic when considered against the planning measures that need to be in place to allow walking to be recognised as a mode of transport beyond high density TOD scores? Yeah, definitely density is useful. Um, in my work, I don't use a threshold approach, which I think is really important. Um, there are some people that can walk 400 metres, 800 metres. There are some people that can walk further um, or less. So I use a curve of diminishing propensity to walk over distance um, to get these metrics. Yeah. Oh. It was, he had a follow-up question. What does the research say? Yeah. Uh, about how far people will walk or how useful is likely to be? Well, so I guess the I guess the what is the maximum possible question was really interesting to me after looking at the Australian cities and coming back with scores of like 30% for most of them. So that's partly why I did international examples. I looked at Edinburgh and I looked at Paris as an example of a really big city, probably 
that feels quite portable. And I found that it's like it's much higher, like much more is possible, even when you're including employment and how many jobs people can walk to. Um, it's actually so much potential with with an urban form that doesn't necessarily read as um, high rise high density, but more like medium density um, and thoughtful planning, less space devoted to streets and uh, less wide streets. If that helps. Still no more questions online. Question. Uh, no, another question about walking. <laughs> um, I was just wondering how you uh, account for terrain in terms of walkability, just because you didn't mention it all. I'm yeah. wondering if you did, because like when you bring up Edinburgh, like um, my experience of being there was the hills are a lot <laughs> and it definitely impacts walkability. Um, so yeah. What parts of it are? It's look, it's something I don't have included at the moment. Um, it's not that hard to do. I just haven't done it. Okay. Yeah, we do have like there are it's in, um, you can if you assume that how much longer people take to walk up a hill is also related to how unpleasant they find it, then it's pretty easy to do. Right? Yeah. I have a question for Christopher, um, and I guess it's um, because I know you've worked as a landscape architect before, or, or in in the area. Um, I'm interested that you're you're developing a model that's looking for the multifunctionality. How much of a discussion is there amongst professional landscape architects about how do we um, achieve multifunctionality through our work? Is it is it a common discussion or is that? An I think it's it's commonly it's so. The one thing to consider is ultimately all landscapes. I'm intentionally designed that way, and so. I think multifunctionality is something that all landscapes uh, architects do consider in their design, but the question is, is whether or not what they're prioritized to emphasize when they're designing the landscape and whether they're prioritizing trying to balance them or whether there's really just one primary focus and if they can do some other things cool. And it's that in, that kind of approach that really I think distinguishes different architects and what they're trying to achieve. I think. Traditionally, most architects were focused on a particular objective and then could try to achieve other objectives as to, with available resources. But it's becoming more apparent that trying to balance more things at once is being incentivized by what people are asking for and about the outcomes that they're trying to achieve. So it's it is it's starting to happen more often, but it really kind of depends on who's involved and whether or not they're pushing for it. And it is happening, it is happening more frequently, but it really varies depends on who is involved in the decision making and who and also who has the power in the decision making as well. Um, so it's definitely there, it's just whether or not it's a priority. Yeah, I had a question hand up as well. Yeah, so just for just being um just gonna say following on the one with the hills in Edinburgh. Um, too, I, I don't really know how you quantify this, but um, aesthetic components come into it too. So, following on from your example with uh, Wallach Creek and um, if there were bridges there, um, that puts you, I think, right next to uh, the I think Princess Highway goes along there. And there's the rail railway on one side of it, the Princess Highway on the other side. Um, when I think about, like, say, you go to the IKEA or anything around there, it might be only a couple of hundred meters walk. But you're going along the side of a highway, there's trucks, there's noise, there's pollution. I'd rather walk five times the distance in a more leafy suburb than around there, too. It will say it. Actually, I think it's very, there hasn't been much research separating these things because in many real life cities, they're very hard to separate because often where you're doing that walk along the highway, you're also walking further. Do I care? Like, there aren't that many. Like in from what well, I think that here is a kilometer. It's hard to walk a kilometer within first mill or somewhere because it's denser. Um, so yeah, there are all these aesthetic factors. They're hard to quantify um, yep. and they're hard to separate. Yeah. We have a question for Christopher from Sunav Adi. Um, how do you achieve multifunction multifunctionality in largely privately owned controlled cityscapes? Uh, a lot of design thinking already goes into using spaces flexibly, but ownership and domain control issues 
need addressing? Yeah, um, so part of it is what's incentivizing the kind of the external context of incentivizing private actors on making those kind of decisions. Um, there is possibility of market forces that may encourage them to do so, um, but it also is an element of their own awareness and whether or not they are seeking that. And that is that is a truth is I think achieving these multifunctional goals are more likely to occur in public spaces because there are more uh, pressures and incentives to push for those things in those spaces. Can it happen in private spaces? Absolutely. But oftentimes it has to be led by a key decision maker that control that has influence of that over that private private space to push for it. And why they do so can vary. Some will vary, will vote will be doing it because they want to be a market leader um, or because they have their own personal values. But I think oftentimes with yeah, with a private trying to force private actor, private owners to push for that, that's that's a, that's a tough area, and I think it's something that's definitely still being navigated. Um, really, and, and I think it really depends on also the country, right? Because different cultural norm, country settings will affect how much pressure these private actors are receiving to push for multifunctionality. I think in more free market, there's probably less of that. Thank you. Well, we've reached five. Oh, Claire. Um, <laughs> but I also yeah. All right, Harry. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just wondering, you, you've like outlined there's a lot of change in students and Airbnb. Um, I was just wondering what the projections of that in the future, like are you expecting to research something that's just going to grow or are you researching a state that you now see is fairly stable and how that might affect what your, I don't know, what your findings are or how you approach it? Um. But I'm not sure I got your question right. Yeah. I, I guess it, in two parts, it's is it are they going? Is the phenomenon you're studying stupidification and Airbnbization? <laughs> um, is that increasing in Sydney? Do you see that growing? And then yeah, if so how would that affect yeah. your your research and your uh, findings? Yeah, yeah, there has been a, a pretty sharp upward trend before COVID for both. Uh, especially higher education students because they are very they make a great contribution to the economy of the country and both for tourists but it just stopped uh after when, when covid happened but the stats show that it it is some sort of the population are is coming back now uh not reached uh the the last 2020 high high numbers but uh it, it doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to stop and there's no uh, there's no reason that it's stopping because higher education industry is uh, is expanding globally tourism industry again is expanding and until now I have no indication that shows that there are risks for this processes to stop happening because of uh, losing to national students and uh, Tourists, I mean, but the, all of these are just apart from the COVID uh, do you, scenario. Do you think the spatial pattern will change? Uh, will, will there be a threshold where, you know, there's a maximum number of Airbnbs and um, things will change? I'm not sure about Airbnb, but uh, about studentification, there is a, the, the process just tries to mature to the same level. Of, uh, well, when a neighborhood has become very, very studentified, it starts to degenerate because students uh, population, they're, they're transient, you know, they're not like local long term staying community and uh, the degeneration of the best environment of the amenities and uh, services, they even facilitates the uh, exit of students from from the from the student uh, neighborhood. Uh, yeah, it and and it's sometimes it's some it's been known to be a precursor to gentrification. But in terms of Airbnb, maybe because it's so much new, uh, new phenomenon, not much than ten years. 
uh, I haven't, at least I haven't come across to something that's saying, okay, well, when is this going to stop and how it's going to stop? Yeah, thank you. So following up on that, like, so especially with student education, like, are there any examples of like vibrant student cities, uh, which which has like major like major student population and have done things right? And is there any learning from them? Uh, Australia learning from those experiences. Yes. So basically, like internationally, internationally there are student cities, but like university towns, for example, where they. Um, are there any which are successful at keeping the work environment and successfully incorporate the student population? Uh, yeah, of course there's been, especially in the UK and I mean some 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 cases in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is it's not a problem of vibrancy uh, in, in student neighborhoods because they are some sort of vibrant because of the uh, student lifestyles. May, it, is, it might not be very pleasant to families to live in a student fight neighborhood, but it is some kind of, uh, because the services and retailers that are serving the young population start to grow in those uh, neighborhoods mostly. Um, and yeah, if, if, if your concern is the vibrancy, yes, there are. And if your concern is uh, about some sort of successful in terms of um, housing and the gentrification concerns. Uh, I should say that, no, they are mostly, there are critiques to that in terms of gentrification. I mean, they, they start to, neighborhoods that are becoming studentified, especially in lower, uh, in developing economies, studentified neighborhoods try to, uh, I mean, it trigger the vibrancy of the neighborhood, but but the, the academic literature usually are, are opposed to that, calling the gentrification and displacement. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're almost at ten past five. Um, it's Friday evening. Thank you, every, everyone online and in person for attending. As uh, we mentioned before, this is our final seminar for the year. The next seminar is planned for 17th of February next year, and we're in the process of um, finalising the schedule. So I hope everyone has a lovely Christmas and New Year's break uh, and returns to the seminar series well rested in 2023. Also, before you go, a big thank you to Ripa for being an incredible organiser. And Lee. And Lee. And Lee yeah, both yeah. of them, so well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.